We're going to get started, everyone. This is um, this is Ray Kung here. I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Jessica Chang, who's one of our own faculty in the Department of Ophthalmology here at Keck USC. She went to Yale for undergraduate, then Duke for medical school, then went to Johns Hopkins, the Wilmer Eye Center for residency. Uh, then she did her fellowship in oculoplastics, um, followed by staying on staff for about two years after that. And here to Keck. And she specializes in oculoplastics as well as neuro-ophthalmology. Um, so some of you may remember Dr. Chang from about two years ago, almost to the day, where um, she gave a lecture on restoring eyelid function in facial nerve disorders. So that's one of her uh, major areas of interest. Uh, she also has, has quite a bit of experience in thyroid eye disease. Um, and an interesting fact that I found in, in your CV was that uh, you're the author of a very well-known article to all of us in the field of ENT throughout the world um, titled, let's see, what was the title? A Nucleation as Endoscopic Sinus Surgery Complication. Um, and I think that was the first and probably only publication um, where there was orbital nucleation from removing what looked like an odd, odd polyp during sinus surgery. Um, so your, your article is famous within us. Uh, and along the same vein, we are going to be learning about um, orbital and periorbital emergencies today. So I thought this would be important since there's a lot of overlap between our two fields, uh, especially when it comes to facial trauma, to uh, cancer surgery, as well as um, invasive fungal sinusitis, sinus surgery. So I'd like to ask that everyone please give your undivided attention and let us give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Jessica Chang. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Um, I, I guess I'm glad that that case report, you know, is, is known. It was a very, very unfortunate situation. Hopefully today, uh, it's going to be an overview of a lot of different diseases. But uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of overlap between our, our specialties. Oculoplastics really is a small slice of ophthalmology. Um, and, you know, we, we really focus on the orbit, uh, but we rely on partnering with otolaryngology uh, because the orbit is so uh, central to a lot of different uh, types of pathology. So, I have uh, no disclosures relevant to this talk. Um, we're going to go over orbital and facial anatomy and how that results in certain patterns of trauma and uh, talking first the orbit fractures and traumatic optic neuropathy. Then we're going to talk a little bit about periorbital uh, trauma with lacerations of soft tissue, uh, eyelids, and adnexa. And then we're going to go through infections and then some pediatric considerations if we have time. So first, um, we're going to trauma. This was a patient I encountered in fellowship who was very lucky because this projectile did not actually injure anything in his orbit. And it's very uncommon actually that uh, projectiles end up in the lateral orbit there. Um, and in this case, we were able to just remove it uh, and did not cause any or fracture. Um, so orbital signs, when we're evaluating a patient and we're wondering um, you know, if they have something that is going to compromise their vision primarily, we're, we're checking vision uh, and if, if that's not terribly helpful, you can uh, look at pupils. Eye pressure is a surrogate measure for orbital pressure and motility uh, and proptosis. So sometimes, depending on the pathology, if there's something just at the apex, you may not have much proptosis. But generally, if you have a, a concerning abnormal finding in any of these, you want to be concerned that there's on until proven otherwise. This can help you distinguish between preceptal and orbital cellulitis, for example. Um, sometimes when patients come in and you know they have a lot of eyelid swelling, it can be really difficult to tell if they have proptosis. It's really difficult to measure or eyeball it because they can barely open their eyelids because they're so swollen. Um, but you can get pretty 
example, flowing from preceptal uh, cellulitis, but everything else should be normal, such as the vision, the eye pressure, and the motility, and that would reassure you that you know this is a preceptal process. Um, optic neuropathy is generally always an indication for intervention of some sort. Um, so first, let's talk about orbital compartment syndrome because it is surrounded by bones uh, on it's kind of like a pyramid. So there's bone on four sides and then on the front uh, aspect, the orbital septum is not very uh, uh, elastic. And so it has a very finite volume. And once you start adding more, or it's blood or inflammation, other fluid, um, you can really increase the pressure in the orbit very dramatically. And this can cause uh, loss of vision that is permanent, and this can happen within an hour. Um, there have been studies, you know, they say that maybe the optic nerve decrease in perfusion for maybe up to 90 minutes under, you know, these are experimental conditions. In the, you know, actual uh, case of patients, there's really no way to tell. And also you don't know when that time started. You just know that, you know, you're meeting this patient who has decreased vision. As you can see in this uh, example, uh, increased uh, vision motility. They're very proptotic. Um, the pressure is very high. You can barely open the eyelids, measure the pressure. So in this uh, case, you really want to do an emergent canthotomy cantholysis um, before even getting any imaging. Now, there's things other than blood that can cause this. So orbital emphysema, especially when you have, um, it's kind of like a, a trap door so that air can get in, but air can't get out. Um, so occasionally you can get into that situation with orbital emphysema, which is why we always tell our patients with fractures, you know, sneeze with your mouth open, don't blow your nose. Um, because you can blow a lot of air all of a sudden into the orbit, and if it can't easily compartment syndrome from that, although it's it's less common, uh, you can also get a compartment syndrome from just inflammation from orbital cellulitis. You can have fulminant inflammation that really increases the pressure in the orbit. This can happen even without an abscess. And then this is a patient I had as well who had orbital cellulitis concurrent malignancy um, and therefore she had no platelets and so she had uh, you know kind of a spontaneous hemorrhage related to her orbital cellulitis and then we did canthotomy cantholysis and as you can see on the on the right side there uh, she did not uh, she continued to bleed from the incision for the canthotomy cantholysis we gave her platelets um, so we tried all kinds of cautery pressure nothing worked she kept oozing um, until she got platelets. You can also have orbital compartment syndrome from hemorrhage into a lesion. So sometimes patients will have a uh, lymphatic this. This is you know very obvious. It's very obvious that this patient has this malformation and this is first this is surgery. This is not an emergent condition. But people can have very small lymphatic malformations that are small until something bleeds into them, and then that can cause a lot of pressure, which can lead to vision loss. So sometimes those things can uh, come up. So again, just to review, orbital compartment syndrome can occur with uh, blunt or sharp trauma, um, with or without an orbital fracture. It can be caused by blood most commonly, but also um, by inflammation or emphysema. Um, it can happen iatrogenically when we're doing, for example, retro ocular forms of surgery. Um, it can happen when we're doing other orbital surgeries. That's something we always worry about when we're doing orbital fractures or decompressions. So whether or not you leave a drain, you can still have compartment syndrome. Uh, and whether or not you have, you know, a fracture or a defect, I've seen uh, patients where we removed a previously placed implant and we were gonna leave it for a while before putting a new implant. And so even though the orbit was completely opened, the maxillary sinus, that maxillary sinus filled up with blood and he developed an orbital compartment syndrome and lost vision until we went back and back. Then he fortunately regained vision because we noticed it immediately in the post-op. Uh, but just because you already have a fracture or something, the orbit is not decompressed. So. Uh, it's still possible to have a compartment syndrome. You can also get this in burn victims with massive fluid resuscitation, especially when they have prone positioning. So 
prone, especially when they're unconscious, um, there can be a lot of pressure on the eye, and that can also lead to this lack of perfusion of the optic nerve, with a very unfortunate consequence of, you know, them waking up blind later, and there's really nothing you can do. Um, and again, uh, non-trauma etiologies and cellulitis uh, or tumors that happen to have bleeding into them. So this was an experiment that was done to show the effect of panthotomy cantholysis and the fact that just because you do panthotomy cantholysis doesn't necessarily mean that you're done and you're good. Um, this is, uh, well, the triangles are exceptometry, so how proptotic the patient is. And the squares are intraocular pressure, um, which closely parallels orbital pressure. Um, because this was a cadaver model, they were able to measure both. Um, so here they did cantho, um, uh, which is of the inferior cruise and the superior cruise. But if you have continued bleeding, and they simulated this by continuing to sort of inject blood um, into the orbit behind the septum, even though you do have this nice decrease after you release the septum, you can orbital pressure and intraocular pressure. And so if there's ongoing active bleeding in the orbit, doing cantonomy cantholysis is not necessarily sufficient. And so you may have to actually go in intraoperatively, find what's bleeding and stop it from bleeding in order to protect the orbit. This is the classic way of you know, uh, cantonomy cantholysis. So you take either a pair of West Glass or iris scissors after you've anesthetize the patients and ideally gotten consent, but if it's an emergency and you can't, um, you know, sometimes the patient's not in a condition where they can provide consent, but you still want to try to save the globe or save the vision rather. Uh, is just simply separating this lateral um, aspect where the upper and lower eyelid fuse. Cantholysis refers to typically inferior cantholysis where you're cutting that lateral uh, the inferior cruise of the lateral cantal tendon. Um, and then if necessary, you can also cut the superior cruise tendon. And this should release the lower eyelid. And if you do the superior, the superior eyelid, so that they're just uh, able to swing open from the lateral aspect. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned before, if it's still, you know, high pressure, then you want to consider urgent orbital exploration. There's been other methods published um, where you basically, you know, make sure that you cut through the septum, but it's the same concept that you really want to open things up. Um, so again, just to review, the presence of a fracture or drain is not a guarantee that you will not get compartment syndrome. Um, you want to do cantonomy cantholysis, uh, but continue to watch the pressure in the orbit. And you can use things uh, like adjunctive medical therapies, such as mannitol, to kind of decrease the overall pressure and swelling in the orbit, especially you know depending on the etiology. Um, and you can get imaging after you do your cantholysis, and that may help guide further management. But you don't want to wait on you know the patient being in the CT scanner, and meanwhile their uh, optic nerve is not getting perfused so high. All right, so moving on to orbital fractures. So in oculoplastics, we typically deal with isolated blowout fractures in the orbit, so either medial wall or, or uh, the floor of the orbit. Um, and some oculoplastic surgeons will deal with more you know, complex facial fractures as well, but oftentimes we partner with and facial plastics uh, to address those. So this is just an example of a large orbital floor blowout fracture, and you can see the enophthalmus with the superior sulcus hollowing. Uh, here, even though this is a frontal view, if you got a submental view, like a worm's eye view, you could see that this eye was sunken in. Um, but just looking from the front, you can see the difference in the appearance um, of the soft tissues of the eyelid, and that's restored after you repair the fracture. So, it's not always obvious that a patient has an orbital fracture, right? So both of these patients have an orbital fracture. Some patients appear, you know, much more bruised. Children in particular uh, often don't come in with that appearance. And so this is known uh, as a wide-eyed blowout fracture. 
Um, and so once you look at motility, you realize something is not normal <laughs> about this left eye. Okay, and so in pediatric uh, fractures, you always worry about extracular muscle. And a lot of people use the term entrapment um, to mean that there's, you know, any tissue kind of herniating or snagged or looking like it might be snagged on the bone or the edges of the fracture. But for me, at least, uh, inoculoplastics, entrapment has a very specific meaning, and that's that there's a pediatric fracture, there's a green stick fracture, and then closed again like a trap door. Um, so like when you look at the scan, you know, there's no open fracture here, but there is muscle tissue stuck in this trap door that has swung shut again. And there's a lot of pressure causing ischemia of that muscle. When we say like trapdoor fracture or entrapment, uh, the wide eye blow up fracture, which is in childhood. Um, and that is an emergency because, you know, ischemia is damaging that muscle. And so if you wait too long to sort of open up the fracture, uh, remove that muscle out of the fracture and relieve the ischemia, that muscle just isn't going to function kills a lot of the muscle tissue, it's going to just become fibrotic and continue to not relax and allow the eye to move. And this is a video just demonstrating the ocular cardiac reflex, which is another indication surgery. So, So he's starting to feel very nauseous um, when you know the, the muscles. So when we're working on extracting muscles during surgery, um, sometimes anesthesia is like, hey, stop pulling on the muscles because you can cause a lot of bradycardia. Um, and in in some patients, this can be pretty severe. You can even cause a heart block. So if a patient has this condition, which can be in a pediatric, you know or it can be in a regular blowout fracture if the muscle is snagged, um, so not entrapped, but just the muscle is stuck down there. And so when the eye moves, it's pulling on that muscle abnormally. Um, and that can be enough to cause this reflex. So of course you don't want to send someone out um, you know, having these symptoms. So that would be another emergent treatment. The mechanisms of orbital fractures, uh, there's a couple different ideas and it probably depends how and where exactly the patient is hit. Um, so one mechanism would be uh, just buckling of the bone of the floor typically because uh, someone punched and they hit them, uh, which is there to protect the eyeball and the floor just buckles as a response. Um, and oftentimes, uh, alternatively, patient gets hit directly in the eye um, and that doesn't always cause a ruptured globe, um, but what protects the globe from rupturing is that you know this bone is very thin, it's like kind of like a crumple zone. And so force hits the eyeball, it's sort of transmitted to the floor and, and it uh, allows for decompression of that force through the thinnest bone, which is either the floor or the medial wall. Um, so that's what coined the term blowout fracture. So before 1974, Lisa was kind of doing immediate surgery on pretty much any orbital fracture, like fracture must plate. Um, and then he published 57 cases where he followed patients with orbital fractures. And he noticed that a lot of these patients spontaneously improved. They did not necessarily need treatment. So um, now, he would still operate immediately if there was early enophthalmos, which you know, suggests a really large fracture. And he would watch them closely, um, usually with steroids in the early period after the fracture, to see if you know, symptoms like diplopia were improving. And if they were not improving, then you know, that's another uh, sort of subacute orbital fracture treatment. But a lot of patients who have a small fracture and they don't have significant enophthalmos or diplopia, really don't necessarily need treatment. Um, so that's very important to, to note. Um, this has been studied by many other people, summarized uh, by uh, Dr. Bernstein, who's one of our oculoplastic surgeons who uh, helped us out at the county. 
And so these are the indications for like immediate fracture repair, subacute fracture repair within two weeks, or just observing. So immediate would be that wide-eyed blowout fracture in pediatric patients where you've got muscle that as soon as possible, definitely within 24 hours, as long as there's no other indication. Um, and non-resolving oculocardiac reflex, as we mentioned. Um, early enophthalmos, uh, which just suggests it's a really big fracture, um, is another indication for uh, repair. Within two weeks, patients who are still having symptomatic dyspopia um, and large fractures that are as, as the swelling is going down that are starting to cause enophthalmos, you wanna to get to those within two weeks ideally. Um, and of course, hypoglobus, which just means the eyeball is sitting, um, which goes along with enophthalmos generally. And then everything else can be observed, really does not need to be repaired necessarily. So the surgical approach to orbital fractures, uh, we almost always go transconjunctivally. Um, others will or transcendental approaches, and sometimes depending on the fracture, uh, that may be uh, ideal. And there's a wide variety of implants that you can use. Um, and I've used a variety, either bare titanium, coated titanium, uh, resorbable like PDS, uh, cut implants that we cut and shape. So uh, it depends sort of on the fracture size and uh, complexity. There's also many different approaches, even if you do a subconjunctival or a, yeah, transconjunctival approach. Um, I have not done this when you sort of split the anterior and posterior down. I usually approach it pretty closely under the tarsus. Uh, and then I try to dissect down to the rim without violating the septum so that the orbital fat stays contained. Um, and then you get subperiosteal um, and you have good access there. Um, this would be a um, transcutaneous. It's very fast and easy. You just kind of cut through, but you leave a you know skin incision, which in a younger patient is, is especially suboptimal. And these are some great photos from my colleague Chris Dumalin, uh, just demonstrating the sort of the, the live what it looks like in surgery. So. Um, down from the border of the tarsus. So the, the inferior eyelid tarsus is about four millimeters tall. Um, and you definitely don't want to cut through tarsus. So um, you can do it at the inferior border of the tarsus or further down. Um, and so you can see he's using a blade here to cut along the marks. And then uh, he uses a similar technique at where you try them intact and you use a combination of blunt and sharp dissection to get down to the rim. And then, you know, incise the periosteum and you get subperiosteal, which is uh, this image is showing the very beginning of the subperiosteal dissection. And then this is showing a little bit later, once this is the actual floor of the orbit that you're edge, and we're elevating the contents of the orbit out of the maxillary sinus. And then you place an implant. Um, and it's very important that that implant rests on the posterior ledge. So when you have a decent sized fracture, um, you know, oftentimes just anatomically, there's a little bit of kind of open. Um, and it's very easy for things to kind of slip off the ledge and this will not fully correct the enophthalmos that you get. So the, the implant likes to kind of fall down into the sinus. Um, so when you're trying to get it onto this lab, it's also really important to kind of bend to the very end and that helps it to find that ledge, but also not stick up into the orbital apex, which is getting pretty tight uh, this far posterior and you can cause a strabismus or even an optic neuropathy if the end of that implant um, is sort of floating up there rather than flush against the bone as shown. One thing to note is a lot of times we see oral trauma that might be uh, caused by domestic violence. This is underrecognized. We probably don't ask about it as enough. Um, it is mandatory to report it if, if you do find evidence that there is domestic violence and uh, for children, you always protective services. So in summary, emergent surgery for trapdoors with ischemic muscles 
or ocular cardiac reflex or early anophthalmos surgery within two weeks for everything that still has symptoms. Uh, so unresolving diplopia or enophthalmos and hyperglobus. And then if you don't have symptoms, observe it, you don't need to do surgery. Um, you all are probably a lot more familiar with Lafort fractures than ophthalmologists. Um, we are sometimes involved uh, when the orbits are involved. Um, and then other types of uh, facial fractures that we are sometimes involved in are ZMC or tripod fractures. Um, Leaf fractures, which can be particularly challenging. So, uh, oftentimes it's when the bridge of the nose is crushed and this bone where the medial canthus tendon is attached has become loose, and uh, you'll get telecanthus, which means the distance between the canthi, this being the medial canthus here and medial canthus there, is larger than average. So, um, and if it's more than 30, you know, that might be because of this. Um, you can also make sure that it's not just the orbit is, you know, or the eyeball is, is distracted. Um, so the interpupillary distance should still be normal in this case, um, assuming there's no like really big other part. So yeah, those are very challenging. Um, ideally, you want to try to keep the tendon attached to the bone. You can plate the bone then, but oftentimes it comes loose and then it's really, really difficult to try to wire something uh, to get it to kind of go back. Uh. <clears throat> so moving on to penetrating trauma in the orbit. Uh, so it's very true, uh, BB guns, you get BBs in the orbit pretty commonly. Um, definitely if you know anyone who has a BB gun, ask them to use eye protection when they're using their BB gun. Uh, regular bullets, of course, in the orbit as well. A BB in the orbit doesn't necessarily need to be removed, but when you have organic matter, it definitely needs to be removed. Wood can be particularly touching because it can look uh, like air on the CT, so you have to be really suspicious. Sometimes it's just an air bubble that doesn't quite have the right shape, right? It's not full, so uh, air shouldn't really influence the shape of the globe as it does here um, and here. And so you have to have a high index of suspicion sometimes because it's not always obvious that there was even an entrance wound, surprisingly. There's no eyelid laceration, and yet a large, large piece of wood is a patient that we treated, actually. Um, and again, no eyelid laceration. You know, this is a demented patient. She had an unwitnessed fall outside. Her eye was a little bit red afterwards. And then just over days, it became more and more proptotic, inflamed, red. Uh, they did a scan on outside hospital, but this was a glaucoma shunt or something. Um, and then she was transferred here, and you're like, that's definitely a foreign body. Um, and you can see it looks like a straw here. We were kind of like, what is that? And it's, you know, it's wood, it turns out, um, just because the, the density uh, of wood looks like air on a CT. And of course, by all this inflammation. So sometimes things are really, really subtle. Um, you don't even necessarily have a lot of bruising. So you really just have to have that high index of suspicion. So in, in our patients, you know, she was demented and she fell. Uh, children also can't really always tell you what happened. Uh, but when you can tell that you know, this eye isn't moving over all the way. Sometimes it's not so subtle, of course. Um, there's a patient who uh, had a self-inflicted pencil injury to the right orbit. And you can see, of course, his eye doesn't move at all. Uh, this is another patient that we uh, published their uh, scuba diving surface, took his mask off, and this needlefish jumped out and stabbed him in the eye um, because needlefish like to go for shiny things. They tend to uh, cause eye injuries and also try to avoid wearing anything shiny like necklaces because they will also go after those um, thinking that they're small fish. And this needle somehow got its uh, jaws lodged all the way in the optic canal. Um, so it caused blindness and also dysmotility of that eye. So in summary, organic material has a really high risk of infection, definitely needs to come out. Um, Certain metals like copper and iron 
uh, more problematic because they can cause a lot of inflammation if they're very close to the eyeball. Sometimes they can cause chalcosis or siderosis of the eyeball, which can you know cause permanent blindness. Zinc and aluminum are a lot less inflammatory and generally can be left alone. Um, lead, of course, can leach into systemic uh, circulation. Well, and other uh, things are inert and can be left alone if they're not otherwise causing problem in the orbit, such as sand, glass, silicone, or plastic. And just a comment. Uh, so the orbit funnels towards the brain. Um, you know, whether this is the fish jaw, the BB, or the pencil, um, the bone direct things towards you know the apex where they the foramina are. Um, so you always have to consider, you know, if something is, is far back enough to penetrate the dura um, or even, you know, these very, very large vessels. Um, and so you want to get imaging before you touch any foreign body that's like sticking out of the orbit. Sure that you're pretty far from there. And if there's any chance that you might be close to these dangerous structures, uh, you definitely want to get like neurosurgery or someone else involved before you do anything with that foreign body. Another uh, feature of the orbit kind of funneling text is that this can contribute to traumatic optic neuropathy because of course the optic nerve is at that apex, it's at the end of that funnel. Um, and so even if you don't have a direct uh, either bone fragment or other foreign body pressing on the optic nerve, the force will be sort of concentrated in uh, that part of the nerve where there's this transition between the orbital nerve and the intercanalicular optic nerve, and that can cause sort of shearing uh, and damage to the optic nerve. Um, now, there's been a lot of research on, you know, what to do with traumatic optic neuropathy, and unfortunately, there's not evidence, it doesn't seem like anything has a consistent benefit. So whether they did steroids or surgery or nothing, there was no significant difference in the outcomes. So there is some you know, evidence that there's spontaneous improvement in a fair number of cases. Uh, and ultimately, you know, without evidence to guide us, it still needs to be a case-by-case -case basis. A lot of people kind of feel like offering steroids, um, even though there's not great evidence for it. I will say that if you have a patient with a traumatic optic neuropathy and an orbital fracture, um, just anecdotally talking with peers, it seems like the consensus is to defer that orbital surgery if they have a large traumatic optic neuropathy. Uh, if they still have vision or even if they don't have much vision, you might want to just wait and see if that will spontaneously improve before you go sort of putting more pressure on the orbit and the optic nerve while you're doing you know, a fracture repair. So that is sort of the not much evidence to guide that treatment. So moving on to periocular soft tissue trauma. This is a patient who had a dog bite injury and you can see this is the punctum. So you definitely know the velocimal system uh, and the campal tendons were uh, injured uh, as well as a lot of other more superficial injuries. So in general, you wanna irrigate well and uh, clean things off and see where exactly the lacerations are, how deep they are, what they involve. Um, you always want to treat with systemic antibiotics for bite wounds. Um, and in general, for like dog bites, you want to look for a second puncture site because, you know, usually thing that's, you know, on the front of the face, but there can be something behind the ear or on the back of the head, um, in depending on how big the dog is, um, where the other side of those jaws were. Um, lacerations involving the canaliculus really should be done ideally within 24 hours, definitely within 48 hours. After that, it becomes much more challenging. Uh, and then patients can have per persistent epiphora. Frustrating thing to deal with. Um, you never want to sacrifice skin, even if it looks necrotic, try to save it. Um, and you also want to avoid vertical tension. Um, so this will cause the eyelid, especially the lower eyelid, to be pulled down. If it's an upper eyelid, it could uh, cause it to be pulled up and not close fully. A lot of surface issues, scarring with you know, corneal abrasions and other uh, corneal infections. So you always want to evaluate, is there actually tissue loss? It can look like there is, but usually things are just sort of stretched and pulled away. 
when they will come together, how deep things are, uh, what other structures are involved, um, you know, whether it's the lobe uh, or the brain. Um, so this was at the time of surgery, you can see that pulsation once we put the speculum in. Um, and this was in the situation of a, a bullet wound that involved the orbital roof and also caused an open globe. So we were there removing the, the ruptured globe and there was enough communication from the you know, intracranial space that that pulsation was transmitted and neurosurgery said, you know, that's fine, just remove the globe. Um, whenever you have something that's medial to the punctum, you wanna suspect a lacrimal injury. Um, it's helpful to have some sort of memorized subpunctum is, uh, has a vertical aspect uh, or the canaliculus right under the punctum of about two millimeters and then it's about eight millimeters and then they form typically in 90% of patients there's a common canaliculus where uh, and then it joins the lacrimal sac um, which of course exits into the sinus. This is just important uh, to maintain and uh, there's a valve there and a valve there at the bottom and the valve Rosenmuller here to prevent reflux from the sac onto the ocular surface uh, and a valve there. And uh, congenitally, this is typically the valve that is not yet open, uh, leading to buildup in the sac uh, and uh, congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, which you eye in an infant, uh, but it can be more serious as we'll kind of go through later. Um, <clears throat> When you have a laceration, usually it's of the canaliculus and you wanna put a stent across it so that it doesn't scar up. And there's a variety of stents and tools that we use to find these cut ends of the canaliculus. And again, otherwise they scar over and there's, it, it's pretty much impossible to do a late repair of this. Eyelid lacerations that involve the margin, you just want to put the margin back together, um, you know, respecting, uh, the anterior lamella and the posterior lamella. And it's just like a puzzle. It's usually the technique that most people will use. There's some minor variation. And then you'll do a deep buried to be inverted so that long term, uh, this will be flush and not a notch vertical tension and again, you know, find that skin, even if it doesn't look terribly healthy, uh, unroll it and see where it needs to go. So this is a patient that was initially repaired in the ED, but you can see already, even though this isn't the best photo, um, that the, he's got early ectropion. This eyelid is being pulled down. Um, and this is like, you know, the day of the repair. So it's only going to get worse as things scar down. And so we, we kind of took him to the OR, opened things back up and advance that skin flap all the way to here, where it had been put there, right? So it needs to stretch all the way to here. Um, and that allowed for things to kind of heal without that. If you have missing tissue, you need to generally use a flap uh, or graft. Uh, this is demonstrating a Hughes flap, which is how we reconstruct large lower eyelid defects. You can do something analogous for upper eyelids, although it's not as pretty. Um, and generally you can't grab it just because uh, it's two different lamella. So either your anterior or your posterior lamella needs to be a flap and then you can graft onto that. So the Hughes flap is a flap of uh, tarsal conjunctival tissue and then you can graft skin on top of that or you can use a flap of skin tarsal graft. Um, but you can't really graft full thickness, although some people have and, you know, gotten away with it in certain situations for reconstruction. All right, so moving on to infections. Uh, and just let me know if we're running out of time. So we're going to just go over vision and life-threatening infections. So orbital flailitis, necrotizing fasciitis, cavernous sinus thrombosis, um, mucromycosis, and newborn dacryocystitis. So again, distinguishing orbital disease from preceptal disease when you're talking about cellulitis, we rely on those orbital signs. When there's doubt, get an image, uh, get CT with contrast. Sometimes even preceptal disease can be emergent. Uh, for example, if you have 
preceptal necrotizing fasciitis. Um, when we're talking about orbital cellulitis uh, with an abscess, this is sort of the uh, rubric that we use for deciding whether we're likely to need to go in surgically to drain from the orbit. Um, usually this is from, so orbital cellulitis with an abscess is typically from uh, sinus infection. Uh, and typically the subcranial abscess will be medial because that's the most common location. Um, and if you treat the sinus disease, often periosteal peri abscess will resolve on its own. Um, and so you don't always need to always go into the orbit surgically. And they found based on a large case series really, that under the age of nine, the etiology was usually a single organism, not a polymicrobial. And you typically don't need to drain these as long as the sinus infection is treated um, you know, with antibiotics. As children get older, it tends to be more mixed. Um, okay. Sorry. I... Um, and then the likelihood that you will need to intervene surgically and of course, even if they're under nine, if you have an atypical situation, such as you know the location of the abscess, the size of the abscess, or if it's causing optic neuropathy, uh, you definitely need to intervene surgically. So if any of the following are present, you, you probably should intervene. So frontal sinus uh, for the subperiosteal abscess or a large size of abscess. Um, Suspicion of an atypical infection like anaerobes, um, which would be noted by gas uh, in the abscess on CT, or reaccumulation after previous drainage. Um, those would all be indications formally and drain this abscess. And of course, acute optic neuropathy. Um, And you know, importantly, abscesses requiring drainage are more likely to recollect if you don't also do uh, concurrent endoscopic sinus surgery. So, um, you know, treating the source since the source is. And going back to you know preceptal conditions that can still be very very serious. Um, this is necrotizing fasciitis, um, and you know you see this large firm collection. And you cut down and you hope that there's going to be this gush, satisfying, you know, release of an abscess. So it doesn't gush out. It's just this whole fascial plane is necrotic and you have to scrape it away and debride it. Um, so that's what necrotizing fasciitis looks like, you know, on the eyelid. Uh, and, it, you know, occasionally it can go into the orbit. Fortunately, um, because eyelids are so vascular and orbits are so this tends to be less serious than necrotizing fasciitis in other locations like on limbs. Uh, it tends to not spread as quickly and not be as morbid, but you still need to treat it pretty aggressively. So you admit them for IV antibiotics and you take them for repeat debridement until uh, there's no more necrotic tissue. So sometimes the area is much larger, sometimes it's really local and isolated to the eyelid. Fortunately, the the more local and isolated kind is what we more typically see. Um, if patients are immune compromised, of course, it can be more uh, challenging. Um, but even in regular, um, with you know the typical group A strep or staph aureus, um, it can be it can be pretty serious. And of course, the dreaded mucormycosis um, is really, really challenging to deal with. Usually it occurs in poorly controlled diabetics or immune suppressed patients. They often have a history of you know, chronic fat. You guys are probably much better than ophthalmologists about checking the mouse and the palate. Um, and of course, you're very familiar with you know, looking for areas that don't necessarily enhance, um, that can be due to the lack of blood flow because of the angioinvasive nature of these fungal infections. And of course, you want to reverse any immune suppression if possible, treat aggressively with antifungals and also debridement. And now debridement in the orbit is a little bit controversial. So it typically was, you know, exonerate, especially if there's evidence of pretty posterior spread. Um, but more recently, there's been a, a big 
globe to do more limited uh, orbital exonerations, which are really just orbital debridement. And so trying to use, you know, injection of amphotericin retrobulbarly or, or sort of placing a drain to infuse amphotericin into the orbit um, in order to preserve the globe because there's really no proven survival benefit globe or the orbit. But it's really difficult to study because patients have different you know, severity of disease. It's fortunately rare enough that it's a little bit difficult to study very rigorously. Uh, but this is an ongoing debate in oculoplastics, and a lot of people are trying to move away from exonerating just because it's it's so good and you know it doesn't necessarily help the outcome. Moving on to cavernous sinus uh, thrombosis, so. Our, our residents at least have their boards coming up soon, so I'd like to review the anatomy here in the cavernous sinus, um, you know, with the internal carotid, uh, third nerve, fourth bone, and B2. Um, so CC fistulas, this is like a classic acute CC fistula, you know, really red eye with tortuous vessels, um, proptosis, extremely enlarged superior ophthalmic vein, uh, because that vein is seeing like arterial circulation. Um, you know, once you address that endovascularly, uh, everything kind of goes back to normal. There are two types, uh, direct and indirect. Um, the indirect is less of an emergency, uh, tends to pre present Trauma can cause a direct one, and that can be really vision threatening because of the elevated pressure in the orbit. And so you definitely want to treat those, uh, and those would be treated by neurosurgery or uh, interventional radiology. Cameron sinus thrombosis um, is more and more rare uh, since antibiotics are more common and people don't tend to get infections that are that severe. But I, you know, I have seen it and it's pathomonic that like one side is affected and then the other side is affected and you see these cavernous sinus signs. So uh, nerves uh, being affected, venous congestion causing a lot of chemosis and orbital edema. Um, and on CT or MRI, you'll also see that enlarged superior ophthalmic vein because of you know the thrombosis in the sinus, and you want to treat that with systemic antibiotic. Um, this is not really a surgical disease, except for the um, congestion in the orbit can cause a compartment syndrome, and so you may need to try to decompress the orbit with canthotomy cantholysis um, or or something else if if necessary. So this is an example. Now, dacryocystitis, in adults, it's not generally an emergency exactly. It doesn't usually cause orbital cellulitis. It's something we treat as an outpatient with antibiotics by mouth. Um, but in, in newborns, it's an emergency. Um, so newborns, sometimes they're born with a dacryocystocele like this, um, palpable lacrimal sac because there's that obstruction in the valves of Hasner. And so the tears are not draining properly. If this gets infected, you know, the child is definitely admitted, put on antibiotics, and we try to probe and decompress that lacrimal sac. Um, if the lacrimal sac is above the medial, or if the swelling is above the medial canthal tendon, it is not the lacrimal sac. And you want to be very cautious. You don't want to probe that. You want to get imaging and make sure you don't have a meningia encephalocele or something. So another reason why this is so important, not just, you know, an emergency, but also it can lead to obstructed airway. So the, the swelling that you see here is not necessarily the only part um, of the lacrimal system that's swollen. You can also have uh, intranasally this swelling where the valve of Hasner is not open yet, but things are sort of ballooning, and that can, of course, cause um, trouble breathing, especially when they're trying to feed, so they need to breathe through their nose. 
So a few other things that are, you know, special considerations in pediatric populations. So when you see someone present with sort of a subacute sort of orbital inflammation, what might be thought of as inflammation or proptosis, um, you know, this could be rhabdomyosarcoma. This can occur, you know, over a few weeks, it can become apparent that there's, you know, something going on in the orbit. Um, and it can mimic infection or something inflammatory, red herring of some minor trauma, but you have to always maintain a high level of suspicion if it doesn't quite feel right or seem right and get imaging. On imaging, of course, you'll see that there's a mass, if there is rhabdomyosarcoma, it tends to have, of course, muscle density and confirm the diagnosis so that you can start treatment. If it's confined to the orbit, there's really good survival and treatment is with chemotherapy, not with surgical debulk, uh, debridement or debulk, debulking. Um, if it's extending beyond the orbit, your survival will drop significantly uh, and want to identify these sooner than later. Another emergency, in, uh, you know, specific to pediatrics is neuroblastoma, so that's the most common metastatic tumor to the orbit in children. Um, rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common primary malignancy of the orbit in children. Um, so, lateral or bilateral, um, you typically get these um, echidmotic sort of raccoonized appearance. Um, it can be associated with the Horner syndrome, uh, as well as octoclonus, which is sort of funny eye movements. And of course, you want to get imaging and confirm the diagnosis. Uh, and it tends to have a better patients as opposed to older children. Okay, so in summary, um, just the, the really key highlights that I hope everyone already knows, and I'm just reviewing things. Um, orbital compartment syndrome is vision threatening. It's an emergency. It needs to be treated as soon as possible. Um, Trapdoor fracture to be treated within 24 hours and lacerations of the eyelids especially involving the canaliculus need to be treated within 48 hours unlike intraocular foreign bodies not all orbital foreign bodies need to be removed um, and not all orbital fractures need to be repaired and not all cases of orbital cellular abscess need orbital surgery for drainage um, there are certain criteria such as you know the typical medial location uh, not super huge, uh, not causing any optic neuropathy, age less than nine, no frontal sinusitis. Usually those can be observed uh, and you can wait for antibiotic treatment to improve things. I'd like to thank my colleagues who contributed um, images and patients <coughs> to this presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for that great talk, Dr. Chang. Um, I have a question about uh, tonometry. I'm just wondering, is that something you think we as ENTs should be trained or is that something that we, we can do in the emergency room, for example, for um, waiting or if there's no ophthalmologist available and we're concerned about increased ocular pressure? Um, are tonal pens, are they easy to use? How would you use them? I, I was never trained on how to use them, but um, is that something you think we should be learning how to use? So I'll say tonal pens are pretty easy to use and a lot of ERs increasingly are having them. But if you're really in this emergent situation where you're worried about the orbital pressure, usually your digital... Um, let me uh, share my video. So. If you kind of feel how firm your own eyes are and then you feel the patient, if it's really hard, it's too high. Um, so that's something very simple that I've used that, you know, everyone can think that the pressure is too high. You can, you can tell by palpation. If the pressure is 60, it's gonna feel like more of a rock. Um, we're, we're happy to train anyone who wants to come by the clinic on how to use a tono pen. Um, I do think, you know, we, we teach medical students and it takes like one time and they're, they're good. Um, and they do have it in, a, um, at least from my experience in residency, the ER tono pen 
is often not calibrated and so it's giving you this error message and you're like fussing with it and if if you don't have a prepare cane right in order to numb the eye you're not going to be able to tono pen them um because they're going to be like ow you're poking in the eye um and so it's a good skill to have and it's really easy to learn how to do and we're happy to teach you um but i wouldn't let that you know deter you like you don't have to fuss with the tone of pen even if you have this sort of emergent situation you can usually tell that things are tense that the orbit is tense if it's tense you know decompress with canthotomy cantholysis or you know orbital surgery if necessary Hey, Jessica, it's Mark Swanson. Hi. Um, I had a question about orbital fractures. So one of the things we always learned um, was that we're, there's a lot of concomitant globe injuries with patients with orbital floor fractures and those kind of yeah. things. So um, in a patient who needs surgery for an orbital floor fracture, one is what kind of injury should we be worried about that we can make worse by globe retraction? And two, you know, which patients or maybe all patients um, should get dilated eye exams before surgery? I think everyone should have the globe cleared before having orbital fracture surgery. Um, and I know that's difficult because at a lot of places there is no ophthalmology on call or there is no convenient ophthalmology on call, but um, even if you have like a microhyphema, which is inside the eye, that can be made worse by, you know, compressing the eye and retracting the eye. And, you know, that can become a, a less than microhyphema, a regular hyphema, and that can lead to high eye pressure and glaucoma, which can, you know, cause some permanent damage. If you have an undetected retinal detachment, that's MAC on, and so macular on and attached still and you don't repair it within 24 hours that's not standard of care so if you're delaying repair uh, because you don't know about an, a retinal detachment um, that that would be suboptimal um, <clears throat> the lens can be sublux all kinds of trauma you know uh, can occur to trauma and you can't necessarily tell just because you know they don't have a lot of bruising on the face or something just because they have normal vision now that's helpful if they have normal vision, but you can't guarantee that there isn't a retinal tear still in the periphery. Um, and some people will have symptoms and some people won't have symptoms of that. So I would say every globe needs fracture surgery, very important. I, I guess a follow-up question would be, if you have a small orbital floor fracture that doesn't need surgery, how quick should those patients see an ophthalmologist for a dilated eye exam? Because, you know, sometimes the ED calls you and you look at it and you say it doesn't need surgery. And I don't know if they routinely see um, someone for an exam. Question two, anyone who has enough trauma, even to cause a small orbital fracture, needs an eye exam, like immediately still. Because even if it's a small fracture, they could still have a globe, you know, injury, not necessarily a ruptured globe, but some injury of the eyeball. So they definitely need to be seen just the same as a large fracture. Thank you, great talk. Thanks so much, everybody. If, if there's no other questions, I guess I'll let you guys move on to your next. Jessica, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Odell, would you like to introduce our- Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to introduce our current laryngology fellow for this year. Dr. Yael Ben Susan. Dr. Ben Susan is originally from Montreal. She did her residency training at the University of Toronto. In addition to doing fellowship with us this year, she's also completing a master's in system leadership and innovation. Um, and one of the things that we've been particularly proud of Dr. Ben Susan is that she's really leading the charge within the field of laryngology in the field of artificial intelligence and AI. 
um, which she can tell you a little bit more about how her interest in this um, developed. Um, but she's really going to develop you know, a research career in this and really leading our field. So um, we're so proud to have her talk to us today about her work. Dr. Ben Susan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Odell, for the um, introduction. Uh, I think everybody can see my screen. I'm going to try to put it in uh, full screen. Everybody seeing my screen? Looks perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, thanks, everyone. Really happy to be here this morning. Um, so we're going to talk about deep learning in laryngology and uh, talk about when doctors and robots collaborate. Very important because we will not be replaced. Um, so AI is really the promise of our century. There are hundreds of new startups every year being created with AI. Um, there's millions of dollars funding in research. If you look at uh, the funding for AI startups in the last uh, five years, I'll show here, um, basically it's booming. And here we're talking about billions of dollars, not millions of dollars. Uh, so really everybody's trying to hop on the AI train. But the question is, are we really going to be replaced by AI robots soon? And um, my answer today, and I'll go uh, further in details, is probably not that soon. So today we were going to talk about um, overview, first of all, basic principle of machine learning. We'll talk about definitions and current limitations. We'll talk about the current literature and what's being done and then what we do, um, our team at USC. And I'll present you with some available AI-assisted products that are currently available for your patients, especially in head and neck, um, that you can offer them. So let's do a little bit of deep learning 101. You'll hear a lot about AI, ML, and deep learning, and people sometimes use these terms interchangeably, but they're not quite the same. Uh, so artificial intelligence started in the 1950s, and it's the engineering of making intelligent machines. When we talk about ML or machine learning, it came a little bit later, and it's really the ability of a machine to learn without being explicitly programmed. So if we looked at programs, sometimes there are programs, uh, computer programs that do exactly the same as an AI program, but it's, it's explicitly programmed by an engineer. And deep learning is learning based on deep neural networks, and this is really a recent technology. So how does it work? So I'm gonna, um, Dr. Odell's gonna volunteer here to answer this question. Um, Dr. Odell, how do you know this is a dog? Um, because I recognize that it has features of fur, its ears, its tongue, its nose. Okay, perfect. So then um, let's see the next picture. So what is that and how is it different from a dog? Well, that's a cat, and we, know it's, and we know it's different because of the shape of its eyes, the whiskers, the position of the ears. Perfect. So Dr. Odell's very intelligent because she found a difference, and, and based on what she's seen in the past, she can tell the difference based on the features she just described. And that's a little bit how AI works. So basically, the AI is actually a black box. I'm going to explain what the black box effect is. But you uh, train an algorithm by showing them pictures of dogs and cats, for example, to train to recognize a dog from a cat. And then it decides which feature um, they want to uh, look at. And then they say, well, it gives you an output that says, now I recognize what's a dog from a cat. But the black box effect is the fact that you don't know what features they looked at to be able to make that distinction. You'll hear a lot about supervised versus unsupervised learning. So these are very important terms in AI. Uh, supervised learning is when you tell the machine what to learn versus unsupervised learning, you provide them with the information and you don't tell them what to learn. So I'll give you an example. And this is my favorite example in my deep learning class. Um, so basically this is supervised versus unsupervised learning here. If you look at supervised learning, um, you would for example, give um, pictures of dogs and of, of ducks and not ducks, but the data has to be labeled. So you tell the machine, this is a duck, this is a duck, this is not a duck. And then the machine gives you a predictive model recognizing a duck from not a duck. In unsupervised learning, you provide the same data, but unlabeled, and then the machine will put it into clusters of how it's recognized it should be divided. So you're not providing them with a classification. 
So if you think about medicine, in medicine, we have a lot of diagnosis. So diagnosis is really labeled data. So you'll hear a lot about supervised learning in medicine because we have diagnosis. Diagnosis, for example, we can say, well, this is a cancer, this is not a cancer. And at the end, the machine learns to recognize a cancer. Unsupervised learning, in my opinion, could be really interesting in medicine, but not very uh, studied yet, but in, in things where we do the classifications. For example, in head and neck cancer, we love to classify as grade one, grade two, but it's human made, right? We made these classification based on what we thought was important. Um, so providing data to a computer and letting them cluster based on what they think is important would be very interesting. Um, the three most important things in AI is data set, data set, data set, and we'll talk about what kind of data set we need to have good models, but how uh, models are made, and, and when you'll look at different research that's being published, you'll see that from the data set used to train the computer, uh, a part of it is used for, for training, a part of it for validation, and a part of it for testing, and then they go through cycles. So accuracy, when you hear about accuracy, it's really important to understand what it means. Um, when, for example, a research says, well, our model was able to recognize this pathology with 90% accuracy, uh, it's actually the accuracy to recognize in his own data set, okay? Um, so if I have a data set of five uh, different uh, patients, for example, I can reach great accuracy. I can reach 100% accuracy, right? Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a model is good. Um, the biggest challenge uh, in deep learning, and you'll hear about overfitting. So that's another term you'll hear about a lot. Overfitting is when a model learns its own training data set too well. And when you try to generalize the result, it doesn't perform that well. So for example, a model can report an accuracy of 99% when it's trained on its own data set, but when it's presented with new outside data, it performs poorly at 60 or 70%. So if I give an example here, let's say I train this model with pictures of these dogs, right? Uh, all beautiful white huskies, uh, and I get a predictive model with an accuracy of 99%, probably if the model's presented with this cute little black dog, I'm not sure it's gonna perform as well. So that's overfitting. Um, the concept of noise is basically background. So when we talk about overfitting in noise, it means like, as I explained before, we don't know what kind of features the model is learning to differentiate between a cat and a dog, for example, again. So I don't know if you guys see in these pictures, but if you notice, all the dogs are outside and all the cats are indoors. So although I can reach a very high model, if I present this model with outside data, oh, sorry with outside data here. So if I show them a cat outside, um, the computer might not understand, right? Because we just, there was a bias here where all the cats were indoors and the, the, the dogs were outdoors. So that's uh, the concept of noise or background. And the most common and popular example of noise is in melanoma. So um, AI started in melanoma with skin lesions and identifying um, malignant skin lesions from benign skin lesions. And they very fast understood that there was a huge bias because all the pictures they provided to train the models, the melanoma had rulers on them because they were malignant and we measured them. And they realized that one of the bias that made the computer recognize them as melanoma was actually the ruler. So that's a really good um, example of noise. So what are good properties uh, of a good data set? So I hope you understood by now and I convinced you that uh, you need quantity, you need quality with minimal noise, and you need diversity of the data set, right? Or else you'll have too much overfitting. And the type of data that's used in laryngology, we have three types. You can use quantitative data, you can use images or sound or voice. Uh, that's can be, you can extract acoustic measures from sound or voice, or more recently, people have started to use uh, spectrograms. So the uh, sound is converted into a mouse spectrogram, and then the image is analyzed by the computer. So what are the current limitations to implementations and why are we not using AI in our lives every day right now? Um, so while robots replace laryngologists, no, because first of all, laryngologists are awesome and irreplaceable. Uh, two, because um, you need to feed the machine. So we are needed to feed the machine to learn. And three, there's ethical limitations. And four, we'll talk about compassion. So 
feeding the machine meanings to train a good algorithm, you need to provide data that's high quality and that's labeled. And basically in laryngology, we are the only ones who have that data, uh, right? No other doctors have them. Uh, we have the voice of the people with the pathology. We have the images on scope. Um, and all of this takes time, expertise, technological resources, and financial resources. So we're not there yet in terms of being replaced. There's important ethical consideration in a diagnosis by a machine. As you know, um, we can sue a doctor, uh, but the problem is what happens if um, there's a mistake by a machine learning algorithm who is uh, ethically responsible. And um, there's an example here in England where a computer glitch caused um, a problem with women that were not called for their mammogram, for their screening mammogram, and they realized that um, almost 300 women uh, could have died from that computer glitch. So that's something that ethicists are working on um, a lot these days. We still need compassion. Uh, I found this beautiful picture of an MRI of a mother kissing their uh, son, their baby, and these are my kids. So humans are still needed in medicine, definitely. Um, so we'll review a little bit of the literature that is being done right now in laryngology, and then we'll talk about our projects um, at USC. So this is one of the first paper in our field uh, from Dr. Galbart at Vanderbilt and his team. Uh, Maria Powell is a PhD. Uh, she's pretty awesome. She's an SLP PhD that works in AI right now. And um, what they looked at, they, they, they looked to see if the computer could recognize a voice that is abnormal compared to normal. So what they did is they took 10 healthy speakers and 70 voice clips of laryngeal pathology of different pathology here. You can see RRP, um, spasmodic dysphonia, unilateral vocal fold paralysis. And the type of data they use is the rainbow passage. So speech data that they converted into visual spectrogram. They found an accuracy of 58 to 90% for binary classification of normal versus each category. So what does this mean? Um, when people read that paper at the beginning, everybody thought, oh, wow, there's a machine that can actually make a diagnosis of RRP based on the voice. That's pretty amazing. And, and if, if that was the truth, that would be pretty amazing because even I, after a year of fellowship in laryngology, cannot diagnose RRP based on the voice. Um, so this is not quite what they did. They did a, a binary classification. So by listening to, to voice clips, it could tell from normal to RRP voice, for example, that the RRP voice was abnormal. Um, so I, I hope I explained it well, but that's a really important um, uh, concept to understand. And what they found is that um, the machine thought that in the category of spasmodic dysphonia, it recognized that the voice was abnormal compared to normal more than MTD, for example. So we're still at the proof of concept level of recognizing a voice that's dysphonic compared to normal, and we saw these different categories. So really great paper um, that um, was in our field two years ago now. There's a similar paper um, from a group in China here, uh, where they used again 400 pathological voices compared to 60 voices, and they used the, the same types of data, which is voice clips converted in spectrogram, but instead of using speech, they used the, the prolonged vowel ah. Uh, and that's an important uh, difference in our field to know what is the best screening method for, um, for screening for dysphonia or pathology. Is it actually a prolonged vowel or is it regular speech? And here in this, they also classified between normal and abnormal and they found out that it's actually easier to classify a male as being dysphonic compared to a female. Uh, one of the hypotheses is that males usually come to see laryngologists later on when they're very dysphonic. So again, it's probably a bias of the data set. So the data set is very important. Um, here I wanted to present you with another type of data, which is image data, laryngoscopy data. So it's starting to really boom in our field. People are starting to use laryngoscopy uh, data in terms of images. And here they looked at identifying uh, post-extubation ulcers and granulomas. Great, great paper uh, from the team of Lee Axt. 
uh, in John Hopkins. And um, what they did is they had to manually annotate images um, to tell the computer, well, this is a granuloma, this is not a granuloma, this is an ulcer. And they found a sensitivity of 82% for granulomas and 62% for ulcerations. So one would argue that these are not great accuracy numbers, but it's actually great in AI because in AI, anything above 90 is extremely excellent. Um, and this is really a proof of concept paper to show that it is possible for a computer to recognize it. But again, um, we're talking about just 127 images. So if we give more images, eventually we will get to better accuracy. Um, this is the best study ever in terms of what there is available here uh, for image and laryngoscopy. It's a Chinese study and uh, only, uh, you know, this part of the world can get so much data. Uh, we're talking about 13,000 images of uh, laryngoscopy of benign laryngeal lesions, precancerous laryngeal lesions, and cancerous laryngeal lesions. And they actually found an overall accuracy of 86%. So it's really close to 90 for detecting uh, precancerous lesion and um, and cancer and lesion and cancerous lesions. So this is an amazing paper, and uh, you know if we can continue to go that route, then it's very promising for being able to um, classify lesions based on laryngoscopy. I just want everybody to understand the amount of work that is needed to annotate these images. Uh, so basically, it's not just you know feeding your stroboscopy to the to the AL algorithm. You have to choose the correct image uh, that represents uh, the most what you want to show the computer. You have to um, cut the image to show what we call the area of interest uh, to the computer. You have to pixelize the image so that the computer understands it, and you have to annotate. So, so we're talking about probably five minutes at least per image if it's done by experts. So it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, the last paper I wanted to show you is um, because it, they use different type, a different type of data, which is quantitative data here. And this is an interesting study on, um, use, um, on screening for uh, neurologic problems um, on, by oral diatocokinesis. So it's a word, word that was always difficult for me to say because I'm francophone uh, while in medical school. Um, basically, they had uh, patients say pataka, 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 and they extracted acoustic measures, and then they fed the acoustic measures. So this time, they didn't feed the sound or the spectrogram to the algorithm, uh, and they found that the computer was able to find a difference between normal and abnormal for uh, the pataka. Um, very small data set in this study. We're talking about 17 speakers. So again, um, I think that most of what is out there right now, we're all at a proof of concept status, which is still great, um, but we're not ready to integrate anything yet because we haven't proved ourselves um, that uh, we're far enough in the research process. Other really cool areas of interest in uh, ENT in general and uh, in medicine um, is using the voice to screen for dementia. Those are the few, a few groups around the world. I have worked with people in Toronto um, who um, basically screen with voice for dementia and they've um, had pretty interesting results. Um, Dr. Kazarian can talk to you about uh, use of breath sounds and voice to screen for OSA. Um, so some um, articles talk about recording tracheal sounds during a polysomnography to screen for OSA, and others have used the voice uh, and the resonance of the voice to talk about oropharyngeal crowding. Um, there is a group in uh, Cornell, uh, Dr. Anais Rameau, who I collaborate with, uh, who actually got NIH funding to um, look at the wet voice, so screen for dysphagia and aspiration pneumonia using the voice. And I'm sure that most of you have heard about these papers that were all over the news where they're using the voice to screen for COVID. Uh, so they made people cough um, and uh, the machine can, can say if they're higher risk of COVID or not. And right now there is multiple different startups that are trying to answer that question. Um, and that, you know, you could see the news article here, Alexa, do I have COVID or not? And again, great proof of concept uh, papers, but we're not there yet. So 
So I hope I convinced you by now that what is needed is labeled high quantity, high quality and diverse data to uh, pursue all of these research efforts. So this is a little bit of our work uh, that I've been working on uh, with Dr. John since I started my fellowship and uh, for my master's as well. So this is our AI team. Um, this is Jeremy Pinto, and he is actually the one who convinced me to go into AI research. He is my brother's best friend. Um, and when I got interested in AI, I had coffee with him and we talked about all the different projects that were possible. He works for uh, the oh. biggest, biggest AI firm uh, back in Montreal. He's an awesome IT computer AI engineer, and he's been doing all our work until now. And Dr. Johns has been a wonderful mentor. He always uh, pushed me forwards in, in these efforts. Um, so the first thing we did is we realized that diagnosis was going to take a long time uh, before we could find, you know, accurate diagnosis with AI. So we wanted to start by easy test. So we said, what if we just use AI to recognize voice gender? So that's a binary classification task. Um, and what we could use it for is for patients who are undergoing feminization voice surgery uh, to provide them with a good treatment outcome measure. So after feminization voice surgery or voice therapy, um, you can give them an app saying, well, this, you know, you've made that much progress um, and your voice now sounds more like uh, a female voice. Um, so I'll present you a little bit of the different uh, things we're working on. This is the first paper we published um, that was published in the laryngoscope, and we showed our algorithm here um, that recognizes voice gender. Um, the important thing about this paper, it does it doesn't give you a binary answer. It doesn't say, well, the voice is female or the voice is male. It actually gives you a percentage of probability that the, the voice is female, it was very important for us to give a non-binary result uh, when you're working with a transgender population um, because we didn't want any tool that was ostracizing. Uh, so I'll give you a little uh, test here of our model. Uh, so we're going to listen to this voice. Uh, the blue spot is on the key again. And then um, you input the voice here. The uh, algorithm gives you an answer here. So here the algorithm says this was 94.74%. This was a male voice. Uh, and um, the other percentage, 5%, that it's a female voice. So I think that for most of you, this sounded like a, a male voice as well. So that's how our algorithm works. Uh... So the next thing we wanted to do is actually see um, how it compared to people who uh, were expert listeners, okay? So what we did is we trained the same models and we talked about how important this data set. So we trained our model, the, the study we published was trained on the Perceptual Voice Quality Database. So it's a database that was uh, put together by Dr. Patrick Walden, who's an SLP PhD and who collected almost 300 voices from five different academic center across the United States. Um, and this is really high quality data with the methodology and uh, they used speech and prolonged vowels. And when we trained our model with this database, we got a 92% accuracy at recognizing a male from a female. And again, this is accuracy in recognizing our own data set. So then what we wanted to do is we said, well, what if we train the same model, but with more data, but poorer quality? Because you'll see that data is actually very expensive to get. We were quoted uh, sometimes twenty-five to $30,000 uh, for just voices of 800 people. So data is very expensive. So there's this Mozilla Common Voices database that's available to all that has 1,500 unique speakers over the world. And basically, you can donate your voice to the computer. Um, so it's tons and tons of data, high quantity, but it's very low quality data. People are recording from their computers, sometimes from their phone, um, different accents, different uh, ages, and no one is truly validating the process. Interestingly, we found a higher accuracy for our model at 94.5%. So here again, our model was performing better with high quality data, a uh, high quantity data, sorry. So then what we did is we tested by correlating with expert listeners. We uh, took laryngologist, we asked Dr. O'Dell, Dr. Johns and myself to rate voices, and we asked medical student to rate voices. 
and um, we compare the low quantity, high quality database to the high quantity, low quality database. And I don't know if you can see here, but actually the uh, Mozilla database performed a lot better. And here, when I talk about the accuracy, it's not the accuracy I talked about before, it's really how it performed when it was presented with new data. We presented new voices um, to both the expert listeners, the naive listeners, and to both algorithms. And we got a 96% accuracy with the model of Mozilla. So that's a very, very high accuracy in AI. So probably, and we're going to present our um, results soon um, at the next Fall Voice conference, but probably in AI, the, the conclusion is that it's better to have more data than high quality data if you have to choose. The next project we work on is we tried to use it, this algorithm uh, and test it on a cohort of um, transgender patients that were having feminization voice surgery. So really the purpose of why we created this algorithm. And we used a, a cohort of patients. There was a, this was a collaboration with Dr. Mark Corey, who has the most beautiful smile here, uh, who's from Mount Sinai in New York. And we took 42 uh, male to female transgender speakers. Um, and we looked at post-treatment voice samples of spontaneous speech, so free speech. And interestingly, we found that there's a correlation between um, the fundamental frequency that increases and the fact that the AI thought that they sounded more like females than male voices. Um, but I don't know if you can see here with my Zoom on the lower... Um, on the lower aspect here, what's interesting is that some patients with very high fundamental frequency were still recognized as male, and some people, some patients with low uh, fundamental frequency could be recognized as female, as female. So what this study showed is really that um, fundamental frequency is not everything. It is correlated to our perception of, of gender, uh, but it's not everything. And we kind of knew that before because uh, when we work with um, the transgender population, we know that even after feminization voice uh, therapy or, or surgery, uh, some still fail to be recognized as, um, as female speaker. And it's, it has a huge um, psychological impact on their lives, uh, but we're still trying to understand why. Uh, this is um, my baby project. This is called the voice collab .ai. Um, So basically when I started getting interested in AI, I started going to these meetings about AI and laryngology and I met with all these great people who were interested in doing the same thing. But we quickly realized that everybody was kind of working in silos um, and, and everybody had a little bit of data. Everybody was publishing proof of concept papers, but basically we were the only one who had the data um, and we weren't really sharing it. Uh, so we created that group called the voice collab .ai, uh, and it's my main project right now. So it's a collaborative of laryngology researchers that are interested in collaborating to uh, fuel the AI research in our field. And we're building this multi-institutional database uh, based on a software that allows clinicians to capture data as they see patients every day. And that will automatically be fed to an AI algorithm to um, answer different research questions about diagnosis. And what we're using is called federated learning. So what is federated learning? Um, federated learning is probably the sexiest thing that exists in AI right now. Uh, if you Google it, well, you will find tons of papers and uh, tons of uh, money invested and mainly by Google. So if you Google, Google federated learning, um, you'll find this uh, page here. They have a whole different website and federated learning is what we call decentralized machine learning. So if you want it before, if you wanted to collaborate with multiple institutions, for example, uh, you would need all the data from hospital A to go to hospital C, all the data from hospital B to go to hospital C, and then the model would be trained um, in hospital C. So basically you need to share patient information, you need to share data. And as you know, there's a lot of HIPAA identifiers. So voice is considered a HIPAA identifiers, age is considered a HIPAA identifiers, date of birth. So there's a lot of boundaries to sharing data. 
So decentralized or federation machine learning is basically the data stays within each institution and is trained in the, on the institution and only the updates of the model are shared to an aggregated server. And that way, basically, you bypass all the HIPAA uh, limitations and you bypass all the problems with multi-institutional sharing and the data transfer agreement that I don't know if any of you has, I'm sure tons of you have done um, uh, multi-institutional research, and it's really difficult with all the data transfer agreements. And you'll see that Google is doing the same because they're actually using the data on your phone to learn. So by developing this area of machine learning, Google will be able to use all the data from your iPhones um, without breaching your privacy because they're gonna learn on your iPhones and then only send the uh, model updates to a third server. So you don't know, but your phones are being invaded by federated learning as we speak. So I wanted to end with uh, cool startups and available AI products that are uh, available right now and that you could actually offer to your patients. Of course, not uh, free, but very interesting. So this is a startup called uh, Voiceit. Um, Voiceit was uh, created for patients with uh, cerebral palsy to begin with, but uh, it's being used for patients with dysarthria. And basically, it uses AI to learn to augment the intelligibility and translate it to text uh, to help uh, patients um, communicate. So I have an example. I'm praying that it's going to work. I'm going to try to play it for you. Not working. I'm going to try again. Not working. OK. OK. So I invite you all to visit the Voiceit website. Um, there's a few examples of how it works, but basically um, the patients speak with the, the, and, and uh, the AI translates what they say and recognize their intelligibility, their words, and translates it into text directly. And then they could use, for example, with Siri to say, you know, open the lights or uh, turn the TV on. Um, so it really is amazing for their communication. And although it was created first for patients with cerebral palsy, it's actually a great product for patients with dysarthria in terms of neuro patients, so stroke patients, or head and neck patients um, that have major or pharyngeal surgery uh, with decreased intelligibility. This is a uh, startup by Rupal Patel. Uh, this is Vocal ID. So Rupal Patel is an awesome SLP PhD from Toronto um, that has been working specifically with patients with laryngectomy with oropharyngeal cancer, and that realized that we had to do something better, um, you know, uh, for these patients because really their voice was so important to them, and it was causing such an important impact on their quality of life. Um, so she has multiple products. One is called uh, Vocal Le Legacy. She records um, the voice of laryngectomy patients prior to their laryngectomy, and she uses AI to produce digitalized voices. But instead of um, giving a voice that sounds like a robot or like Siri, for example, when the patient types, it will um, give a voice that sounds like his own voice. So, you know, if the patient types by communicating, for example, you would hear uh, the text as uh, his own voice because it was mixed with his previous voice. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's a little bit pricey, but she's always willing to work with academic center to provide lower costs for patient. So um, definitely uh, a company to look at. Um, another cool startup by uh, Dr. Anais Rameau back uh, in Cornell. Uh, I think she won an award uh, at a hackathon for that, and she's developing it. So she's working on silent speech. So this is specifically for laryngectomy patients. Here you can see, oh, you can see this is a laryngectomy patient because you can see the stoma here. Uh, and basically it works with EMG signals. Uh, so this is a device that you put on the face and that captures the EMG signals of your articulatory muscles and then produces uh, real speech based on what you're trying to say in terms of articulation. So um, it's a really great product. It's not done yet. Uh, there's active research being done, but um, once this will be out, it will be a major innovation in our field and can potentially really open doors for silent speakers. 
So in conclusion, uh, this is a quote from somebody uh, called Bill Gates. You probably know him. Uh, we always overestimate the change that will occur over the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur over the next 10 years. Uh, and I think that really gives a good summary of where AI is at um, in, in you know, 2021. Uh, I don't think we'll be replaced by robots in the next two years, but certainly we'll learn to collaborate more with AI um, in, in the next decade. And uh, in conclusion, machine learning really has a future in our practices. It's not going to replace, replace us, but it's really going to help us become more efficient. So, you know, maybe not give us diagnoses, but maybe uh, help us with screening, for example, things to do where we don't have time as doctors, right? When we have a hundred different um, consultations, piles of consultations piling up, which ones should we screen to see, uh, to see first, for example? So these are things that AI can help us with and that we'll definitely be using in the near future. Um, I hope I convince you that we need big data, labeled quality data, and diverse data, and for that we absolutely need multi-centered collaborations. Uh, and I think um, you know we're going to see more and more of that to be able to an answer um, great research questions. So, thank you so much. Happy to answer any uh, questions. This is my emails, and uh, as we take questions, I will leave you with uh, the best AI memes that I found. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, well, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. I think uh, you know, a lot of uh, excitement to go forward. I think in sleep apnea, you mentioned that you know screening, uh, which which may may make sense. Um, we we've talked before about the challenges with that. I mean, the whole field of sleep medicine is based on diagnosis with sleep studies, and so screening may or may not have something. The problem is it's not reimbursed. So there's some challenges there, but I have a question about uh, image data, like single images. And you talked about sort of picking the right image and all that kind of a thing. The problem be solved by using video. And I mean, obviously it's a ton more data, 30 frames per second and all that, but, but you know, that would take, eliminate one of these features and allow Sort of, I guess, non laryngologists or you know people that to, to provide data to a system. What are some of the besides just the sheer volume of data? What are some of the real challenges associated with using video versus still images? I mean, obviously you have with voice you have a uh, you know lots of data, but just not visual data, just audio data. So that's a great question. So right now, you know, the, the medical field still uses mostly images. So if you look at forget, you know, forget laryngoscopy, if you look at uh, imaging studies, like in breast cancer, you know, they look at MRI, they look at scans, and we're still at the image um, at, at the image status, right? Like when when all the, the research that's done on on CT scans or MRI for breast cancers or for uh, for strokes, you know, they're not using a full film, a full video. They're using images that are annotated, and they use people to annotate the area of interest. Um, probably, you know, the video will come next. Um, the, the studies that I've seen are not uh, from uh, our field or from medical research, right? It's more in terms of startups. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to develop, but it's a lot more complicated, of course, than, than still images, and it's a lot more data. Um, so we're not there yet. But, but yes. Uh, so, so if you look at the, in terms of laryngoscopy, you know, there's, there's way to accelerate the process by creating AI algorithm to pre-process the data. So I actually reviewed the paper from uh, Europe a, a month ago, um, where the whole paper was actually to develop the AI software to pre-prepare the laryngoscopy images. You know, so instead of manually doing it, you actually train the computer to do just that part. And then then you, you've simplified or you, you got all the process of preparing the data more efficient. But if you look at most studies, you know, when you, you read an AI study, re, the data preparation is, is a whole description in, in, your, in your paper, right? The, the data preparation is a whole science. 
Um, yeah. So, and, and that's probably the limitation for now because to be able to fuel research and to be able to be at the, at the level of where startups are, non-medical startups, because there's a huge discrepancy between where we are in medicine compared to, to the private world, right? Um, you need to put funding into, into figuring this out and into preparing data, gathering data automatically. Um, so that's why I think our, our voice collab, obviously I'm preaching for my, my own project, um, but I think the money has to go in the data collection and softwares to collect data easily and softwares to prepare data automatically because, you know, going retrospectively and annotating data is not, not going to cut it. We're not going to go very fast. We're always going to be on a proof of concept. Um, so I think that where the money needs to be because the AI technology is there. It's really the softwares to capture uh, the data automatically and to process it automatically that's going to be needed, in my opinion. But just, I mean, just use an example. I mean, 15 years ago, uh, I think the, the brand name was PillCam, but I mean, gastroenterology, they have these pill cameras, and they're literally a pill. And what they do is they get a few hours of video, and they had an algorithm to, to fast forward to everything that was red, because that was blood that was bad. And so basically what they do is a clinician could then review not two hours of video, but just go to individual images of everything that's red and basically make some judgments about whether that was suspicious or not. Theoretically, something like that could be done. I mean, 15 years ago, that they were going forward to everything that's red and they didn't need any preparation, but then you would get sort of a series of still images or something like that. I mean, the larynx, obviously the larynx is dynamic, but it's one area of the body. It's not like a whole small bowel or whatever that was used for, for the pill cam, but it seemed like there would be something that their way to sort of fast forward at least to the still images or to a segment or something like that, that would be straightforward. And as you talk about, it's, you know, having all the preparation, it, you want to eliminate some of that thing, but it's very, very thought provoking. So anyway. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, and it's being done, right? Like if most, most people in the world who are really, you know, um, doing big efforts in, in, in research are there, are working on the data preparation and finding ways to go faster. Um, so it's being done, but not ready yet. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, great talk, really enjoyed. So um, uh, we, we do uh, speech evaluation after tongue reconstruction to uh, dynamic, um, using dynamic, real-time dynamic MRI. And now we have a new machine, uh, it's a low Tesla, which is very good. So I was wondering when this, how we can collaborate or put the data of the speech uh, into your uh, system or your collaborative We would love to. <laughs> so, so we would love to. Uh, uh, first of all, we should probably meet and, uh, and discuss that. I think that'd be great. You guys have a new center for AI that was just created at USC. Um, so, you know, we, we should definitely meet and talk about um, how we can collaborate for that because it, it's a great source of data um, and, and do it instead of going retrospectively again, maybe just start from now and just be able to collect that data and put it in the database right away. Um, and if you have, you know, centers like that where, where really the data is, is great, you should definitely will put you in contact with this new uh, USC center that you probably know already. Uh, but they'll be really thrilled to collaborate, I think, because they're always looking for, for collaborations with the medical uh, field. Okay, well, me, thanks. Ariel, it's John. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I mean, how did you learn how to do this? This must take a lot of programming and stuff like that. How did, are you a computer science major or something? Not at all. Uh, it's called fake it till you make it. Uh, basically, I, I got interested in it um, after I gave birth to my twins because I was just, you know, had tons of time, a free time, uh, but I was reading about AI stuff. And then during my master's, I decided to do my thesis in AI and I took, um, I took AI ethics courses and I took a deep learning class where I learned to code with AI engineers. I don't code for myself. So I don't think doctors need to learn how to code to do AI. Um, and I think most doctors who uh, are interested in AI and do AI work don't. Um, it's really important to collaborate with the AI engineers, but I think it's good to have a, that's what I took. I took this, this coding class just to have a good understanding because when I started 
um, you know, I got work back from the AI engineers and I couldn't really criticize it or give ideas. I just had to trust what they were doing. Um, but now because I have some clinical, you know, in input and information, and now I understand a little bit more of how AI works and have some uh, coding uh, skills, then I can also tell them, well, this doesn't work, this doesn't work because of clinically, it doesn't make sense. Um, and that's been very helpful, but I don't do my own code. Some, a few, a few people do in our field. And I think that's really amazing. Uh, I'm not that good. Uh, and I always, uh, I always collaborate with the AI engineers and they have all the infrastructures, right? Um, so they have the computers that are very expensive. Um, that's why you don't want to get funding to fund the computers. They have all of that. That's why I think all the funding should go into developing the, the software for data. Yeah, the promise of the electronic medical record for uh, deep learning is high, but nothing's happening. Just be, like you said, all of the HIPAA restrictions, and then there's competing platforms that don't share nicely between each other. It's really a shame because if you could just collect the data as we're entering it and process it automatically, um, I mean, you wouldn't actually have to do projects kind of one by one and collect yeah. your own data little by little and with your own little individual platforms. <laughs> it could it could be in Cerner or it could be in Epic or all together. Someday. Someday. What what's it I took a class in innovations, not AI, you know, and they show you all all the reasons why AI why uh, sorry, what innovations uh, are hard to be integrated. And there's all kinds of factors, right? There's money, there's time, there's the fact that status quo is a lot more comfortable than progression, unfortunately. But you're right, when we think about in theory, you know, it's simple. How is it possible that we're still with a million different uh, EMRs in different hospitals? It doesn't make any sense. But again, to start over again takes money, takes effort. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get there. But it's, it's slow. But happy to, if anybody has ideas or collaborations ideas, please email me or just uh, uh, talk to me uh, in clinic. Um, really happy to, to talk about it, have coffee. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Are we good? Thank you so very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. It was fantastic. And uh, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.